All right, so let's talk about what dementia is. So dementia is a um, term that's very similar to cancer, right? So if somebody tells your loved one that they have dementia, your first question should be, what kind of dementia is it? Um, because it is an umbrella term. So if somebody says you have cancer, you want to know, is this lung cancer? Is this breast cancer? Is this pancreatic cancer? Uh, is this uh, brain cancer? Why do you want to know? Because there's going to be different treatments. Um, and there's a whole different set of plan and caregiving uh, that goes along with that. Dementia, um, the different types of dementia involve uh, much the same thing. These dementias are not all the same. Uh, they, are, are, they manifest in their symptoms of different kinds of proteins uh, accumulating in the brain. The treatments are vastly different um, for many of them. Some treatments that might work for uh, one dementia can be fatal for another dementia. So it's very important if you get a diagnosis of dementia from a doctor um, that you clarify with them what that is. Um, what, what type is it? And we'll talk about a few of them. So dementia is a decline in one or more functional thinking or um, memory abilities. Um, what makes dementia dementia is that it has to be severe enough to interfere with daily activities, your social functioning, your occupational functioning, um, your functioning at home. Um, so if it's not impacting significantly those uh, domains, it's not going to be diagnosed as dementia. I'm not going to run through the statistics. I think you probably have heard a lot of these. I'll read just a few. Um, this was taken off of uh, the Alzheimer's Association's 2000, actually this was a website that is a conglomerate of the 2014 Alzheimer's Facts and Figures Report put together by a CNN um, reporter. But essentially, you know, it's pretty staggering, um, the numbers that you see up here. So we have Alzheimer's disease as the most common. There's more than 5 million Americans that are living with Alzheimer's disease. Every 67 seconds, a person is developing it, unbeknownst to them, likely. 24% uh, of uh, people believe that AD, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, must run in their family um, for them to be at risk, and that is not true. So let's just take a look briefly at California. 10% of the nation's Alzheimer's patients live in California. That's about 588,000. Those numbers are expected to double in the coming 15 years or so. Numbers among Latinos and Asians are expected to triple. And for those uh, baby boomers, uh, 55 or older, <laughs> one in eight of us is going to develop Alzheimer's disease and one in six of us will develop another dementia. <coughs> so risk factors. It's not just having a family member. The greatest risk factor is age. Uh, most people will develop dementia at age 65 or older, but from that point forward that number is going to double um, about every five years. So that by the time we hit our mid-80s, we have a one in two or one in three likelihood of developing dementia. So the age is the biggest risk factor that we know of. Family history. Um, so if you have a first line relative, mother, father, brother, sister, that increases your risk. That is not a deterministic risk factor. That is just an increase in your risk. It doesn't mean because you have a relative that had the disease that you're going to get it. Um, uh, so there's a, this gene, the APOE gene, apolipoprotein E gene. It comes in, I think, three forms, E2, E3, and E4. You get one of these genes from each of your parent. So you could um, have one a APOE4 and one APOE4. So even if you inherit just one of those, um, that's going to increase your risk. That doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. If you get two um, APOE4 genes, um, that's what we call deterministic, and that's going to result in uh, an Alzheimer's uh, disease at some point in your lifetime. 
So we have mild cognitive impairment. That puts you at increased risk. I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. Um, mild cognitive impairment uh, can look like a lot of different things, and it can involve different functions, brain functions or domains of brain um, function. The mild cognitive impairment that includes a memory component to it, someone that's having difficulty remembering things, that memory component, that group of mild cognitive impairment folks are more likely to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And that is going to uh, affect our brain and thus increase our risk. And then there's other symptoms that will increase your risk if you have those health conditions. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, um, obesity, diabetes, if you smoke, and all of these things sort of tie together because they impact ultimately that flow of uh, blood and blood rich uh, oxygen rich blood to the brain. Researchers have also found that low levels of education and low levels of um, cognitive stimulation can increase your risk. And then lastly on this slide is uh, brain injury. So any traumatic brain injury um, to the brain that uh, um, causes cell death um, destruction, um, loss of functioning is going to increase your risk for um, dementia as you age. Heard a lot probably lately about football players, um, the condition that they have with these multiple concussions and uh, the problems that they're having. So, uh, but sports are not the only way that it can happen. Car accidents, falling, um, violence, that kind of thing. And I talked about this earlier. This is that APOE4-4 combination. If you get a 4 from your mother and you get a 4 from your father, that's deterministic. And then there's these other genetic component, um, uh, amyloid precursor protein and presenilin 1 and 2. I'm not a scientist, so don't ask me to tell you um, what it is about those, but it, those three genes um, are, do not look good for um, per, you know keeping you out of that diagnostic category. All right, let's talk about the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. I have this graphic image up here. Um, the question mark over in the corner is just someone that's experiencing that memory component. They're just forgetting day-to-day, uh, just daily things. They're forgetting words, maybe. They're forgetting appointments. They're forgetting um, that they put the laundry in and it's staying in all day. Um, they forgot that they um, needed to go pick up their prescription. And so they're functioning on a day that, and they need their medication, but they don't have it. So day-to-day -day memory problems. They may be repeating questions, asking you the same thing. They may be um, just generally forgetful. This other image that looks like a dictionary page there has to do with components of language. Um, so this is difficulty finding words. Uh, this might be difficulty looking at a word and recognizing a word. This might be difficulty knowing how to spell a word. Even a simple word, like the word of. Just not being able to remember or figure out. That's not necessarily a memory problem because that's a different area of the brain, but having problems. Receptive, being able to understand language, and expressive, being able to um, produce meaningful language. The image of the um, fellow tripping, and you'll see me do it over here on the rug, <laughs> is a visual spatial component of the um, disease. Um, so this is where um, perception, uh, interpretation, of visual um, things around us become impaired. And so I might um, just, I might forget, like I have, that there is a carpet here and keep tripping over it. I might also look at the carpet and not know what that carpet is. I might look at that carpet and think that that's a hole in the floor or that that's some kind of animal lying there um, or that that's a person. Um, I can be very confused by it. Or I just might totally misperceive it. It's right in front of me. I might think it's five feet in front of me. So if you see dings on a car, um, somebody tripping and falling quite a bit, those might be signs 
um, of a problem. This image here at the bottom, where we have the guy with the briefcase and he's running off to buy the Maserati here, and he's taking all of the life savings, all of the retirement income, cashed out all of the investments, and comes home with a Maserati instead of um, a plan and uh, uh, significant savings for retirement and the long term. So this, it, this is to indicate uh, a lapse in judgment uh, and planning. Uh, or problem solving that, that might occur. So up at the top we have this road sign and we have a clock. So this is to represent problems with orientation. This is orientation to time, orientation to place. So someone who asks repeatedly what day it is. Someone who when you ask them what year it is they say it's 1964 or it's 1944. Or, you know, I moved to California in 2012, yet my spouse or my family or my children know that we've been here for 30 years. Okay. Um, or difficulty um, navigating in your surroundings. So a person might have difficulty, you know, when we are out and about on the street, you come in here, you recognize where you need to turn. Whatever the landmark is, or you see the sign, you know what the sign means, you know where to go. Somebody with uh, dementia affecting um, this part of their brain does not uh, necessarily recognize signs. So, excuse me, they might head out to the grocery store or head to the university club for the lecture and end up um, over at the medical center in Orange or in Tucson, Arizona and never make it back. Okay, so um, it's significant difficulty um, navigating your way around familiar environments. So we have the cookie sheet up here. This represents having difficulty doing things that are um, very familiar daily kinds of tasks. You just forget all of a sudden um, how to put the uh, spatula under the cookie when you want to take it off the uh, off of the cookie sheet. Or you leave out key ingredients. So it's just difficulty with every um, day tasks that you have been uh, almost wrote, been able to do without thinking about it. Um, our little guy here with the magnifying glass represents misplacing things and not being able to find them or putting things in odd places. So you open up the uh, freezer and there are your uh, father's socks uh, and shoes. Um, or you know, you're looking for something and you cannot find them. Somebody just cannot even uh, remember or retrace. You and I, hopefully, um, although sometimes I wonder about myself, <laughs> might be able to, if we misplace something, sort of think, well, okay, what did I do first? I came inside, I said hello, I put my keys down, and I can backtrack through that series of events that happened when I walked in the door and remember. Someone that's um, suffering from a memory impairment is not going to even remember that they came in the back door and not the front door. Or they may not even remember that they've lost something um, until um, it's critical that they need it. And then it's, there's, no, there's no recall for that information. This image here with the book club uh, indicates um, social withdrawal. Um, it's just sort of apathetic and, and losing interest in your day-to-day -day activities. Um, somebody who plays tennis or golf or has a book club and they just sort of start withdrawing from participating in that or they don't initiate um, getting up and going to that. And then our final um, image here of the checkbook is that's sort of one of those higher level uh, uh, thinking abilities where there's analysis, there's problem solving, there's evaluation, um, there's calculation, um, and that's something that is uh, a more complex kind of activity. So this is just in words, all of those words I've been saying. The key important factor here, we talked about it again, I'm gonna highlight it, it's not dementia until it starts to interfere with your day-to-day -day activities. So if you don't balance that checkbook and you miss the mortgage payment, or you write that check for the Maserati and you have a mortgage payment and a car payment and insurance and your child's tuition, that's in fact in your life. Does that make sense? Okay. Wow. 
Um, this slide I have up here, um, we have three different types, oops, 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 three different types of dementia up here. Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, and frontotemporal degeneration. And this slide I put up here mostly just to highlight for you why, um, I don't know if any of you had difficulty getting a, a diagnosis or if you have experienced that with someone that you love, but this is just a highlight for you that these diseases share some common symptoms. Um, some folks can have symptoms of, um, mostly it's Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, but sometimes there's Lewy body, thank you, uh, Lewy body um, symptoms or features combined with Alzheimer's disease. And so we are really kind of not very good unless you're with a specialty uh, clinician about diagnosing uh, these dementias. Lewy body dementia may or may not involve memory. Lewy body dementia uh, is oftentimes uh, confused with Parkinson's disease uh, because it involves some of the uh, motor type of symptoms. Memory may not be involved. Another key feature of Lewy body is um, hallucinations, visual hallucinations. And they're very uh, detailed, they're very well formed. Um, these are different than the kinds of hallucinations that you might see in a mental illness. But this creates a problem if you're seeing a physician and you have these uh, psych psychotic kinds of symptoms where you're seeing things or you're hearing things, or your loved one is, um, and they see a doctor who's not familiar with dementias, and they, this is one of those uh, uh, dementias that can be very um, challenging for you. And if you are have a loved one that's diagnosed with this one, you want to take all the information from the table that you can. Um, but it can look like a mental illness. And so the first thing that somebody might want to do is to prescribe an antipsychotic. And an antipsychotic with Lewy body dementia can render the person um, uh, completely um, immobile and even kill them. So uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's important to differentiate. Between, that's the reason why you have a diagnosis of dementia. What dementia is it? Um, it can look like Parkinson's disease. Um, FTD um, can involve the same sort of apathy and lack of initiative that you sometimes see in Alzheimer's. Uh, it can have some um, rigidity and tremor that you see in Lewy body and Parkinson's disease. Um, but it primarily, uh, there's a different subtypes of uh, frontal temporal dementia and it, it involves, one is a behavioral variant and that is where you see somebody that's acting inappropriately outside of the acceptable social norms. So someone who says things that just whatever they are thinking, they say it. Um, not uh, concerned about the consequences of either their behavior um, or their uh, vocalizations um, about how that will affect people around them. Um, it also involves emotional blunting. We're talking about caregivers. This can be really difficult for caregivers when you have someone that um, used to be very attentive with you and affectionate with you and interested in you or the children or the grandchildren and all of a sudden they just um, don't seem to have any connection. Yes, there was a question. Yes, um, I had a situation where my parents were in Florida a couple months ago and my mom called me and said, oh my God, your dad's going the same way as his sister. He's got Alzheimer's. And I said, Mom, from what you're describing, it sounds like he had a stroke. And I had to fly there, get him to the hospital, and it turned out he was having mini strokes. Um, is that something that happens that, you know, if you don't know, it doesn't get diagnosed correctly or... Um, well, here's, here's the thing about the difference between a stroke and a dementia, and that's one of the things that we will talk about, I'm going to actually move us on after this, but a stroke, when you have a stroke that results in symptoms, a stroke is something that happens like it's really sort of abrupt onset of symptoms. Out of the blue, somebody starts um, slurring speech or tripping or falling or um, not being able to communicate, those kinds of things. Dementia is an insidious, slow process and things happen um, that you might think, oh, that was kind of odd. And it, it just sort of builds over time. So it's different to what you would see in a stroke. Yeah, but you're talking about a big stroke. <coughs> you 
these were little mini strokes. I think they're called TIAs. TIAs. So TIA is different than a dementia, and TIA generally, if you have symptoms resulting from a TIA, um, they're going to resolve. Oftentimes, they will resolve over time. Dementia symptoms are not going to resolve. All right. So. You see those signs or symptoms in you or anybody else you want to get a comprehensive evaluation. Yes, ma'am. The meaning of syncope. Syncope. Syncope is um, they think the result of a drop in blood pressure and it's it's a, like a near fainting or a fainting episode. Yes, please stop me. I know I'm going quickly um, if, if you have a question. Hopefully I can answer it. If I can't, you can always email me um, and I will respond to you. All right, so comprehensive evaluation. You want to get it, you don't want to wait. And why? This slide is showing up in every conference, in every sort of talk. And the highlight of this form is, I'm just going to be quick, but we used to see people um, in dementia up here on this range, um, even off of this chart, because for so long people thought, oh, it's normal aging. Um, oh, you know, I haven't been feeling well, and oh, I had this surgery, and oh, um, and doctors as well. Uh, what we know now, and what we've learned over the last 30 years is, um, it, this is not normal aging, and I'm going to show you what a comprehensive evaluation can um, uh, look like to make that more clear. But what everybody is focusing on now in research is way back here. So by the time you're seeing symptoms, you're already up here. So this, this red line here is the protein that's forming uh, up in your brain. And you see that that starts back here when you're normal, decades before you start to feel symptoms or show signs and symptoms that are visibly apparent to folks. Yeah. Um, and then when you get to uh, this line, this is the, where the clinical signs start to happen. So essentially, uh, if you're experiencing signs and symptoms, oftentimes the medications that we have right now, they work best the earlier that you start them. Um, and science is all pushing back to this phase now to try and understand what's really happening in those decades before with those proteins so that we can work back here and maybe um, slow, prevent, uh, cure, and stop this um, cascade of events that happen. This is what a comprehensive evaluation can tell you. Um, what's normal? What's mild cognitive impairment? What's dementia? Which one do you have? What are the causes and contributing factors to whatever is happening with you or your loved one? And you can walk away from that evaluation with treatment recommendations. And we want to focus today, there, I'm not going to cover the treatment recommendations for the dementias because we want to focus on caregivers. Um, but you should walk away from that evaluation um, with treatment recommendations that include the caregiver. Um, so, okay, what's normal, what's MCI, what's Alzheimer's disease? We talked a little bit about it. Normal person might have a momentary blank. I'm going to lose a word here in this presentation. I'm going to stumble, I'm going to try and find it, I'm going to blank. Um, I'll come up with another word, or I'll remember the word in enough time for me to keep going and have a, a, a good flow that you can hopefully understand. You'll let me know on the evaluations if I don't. <laughs> um, MCI um, is where someone frequently forgets and doesn't, they're having more than just um, a problem that I might have uh, under stress or I might have. Um, in a moment of uh, frustration. This is something that happens and is starting to happen uh, much more frequently. And by the time you reach AD, you don't even know that you've forgotten. It's everybody else around you that recognizes that you've forgotten. Same thing with, um, so I talked about searching for a word. Somebody with MCI might have much more noticeable dis difficulty with word finding. Um, by the time they get to AD, or maybe it's a, a frontotemporal uh, degeneration problem that involves language, that's going to look more like trying to get the word up, or um, a lot of hesitancy, or talking blah, 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 yes. 
something that comes out and it doesn't make sense and it sounds stroke-like. Okay, so very different between normal mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And what do you want to have as a part of that exam? These are all really um, important components. You want a structured cognitive assessment. That's one of the things that I do um, at our clinic. Uh, it's a test that uh, is kind of like what we did today at the start, um, only not so much fun. Um, but it, it takes you through all sort of domains of brain functioning and gives you exercises um, and activities um, and you uh, are using, these are using evidence-based materials that have been normed across the country internationally. Um, and they're going to plot out and show you how you did on that based on your age and education level. So there's a cognitive um, testing component. There's an informant interview. Informant interview, that's what we call it in our center. That means you do not want to just be talking to the person that has the disease. Why? Can anybody tell me why? <laughs> they don't remember. <laughs> anybody else? They won't necessarily tell you. They won't tell, right? They might think that you have the problem, not them, <laughs> right? Um, yes. uh, what else? So they just might have um, benign lack of insight, right? Because the, the, the brain is being affected and brain cells are dying, and it's uh, they're not trying to drive you crazy either, okay? It's, it, it is a brain disease. I don't have slides up here, but when you see the slides of actually what happens to the brain between normal and someone with uh, late stage Alzheimer's, it's shocking, okay? It's, it's really um, in, an incredible uh, difference. And what I want you to keep in mind as caregivers going forward is that it is a brain disease and it's progressive. Um, so that's the bad news, but the good news is that what was absolutely um, unbearable and frustrating and incomprehensible for you today or last week or the last month is likely going to shift in another month or a couple of months as the uh, disease progresses. It's not going to be any easier, but it'll be a different set of symptoms. So, um, okay, you want a medical history, a complete medical history. You want to know surgeries. You want to know medications. Medications, that's next. Uh, you want to know, um, get a hold of all of their medical records. You want to find out uh, what, um, you know, do they have high blood pressure? Do they have high cholesterol? What's the family history of illness? Um, we check everything. Um, do they have any brain scans? You want to do blood work and labs. Um, we want a complete history. You want to do a complete medication review, and that includes herbal remedies and alternative medications and um, over-the-counter cough syrups and uh, allergy uh, medications that you're taking, as well as your prescription medications. And that's because many, many of those medications have synergistic effects in terms of um, impacting your cognitive function, memory, your, your balance. Um, uh, I don't know if I have it out there, but there's a whole sheet about medication um, that uh, impacts memory if not taken wisely. Uh, there's a whole sheet out there about medications and falls and combinations um, of medications you want to be really careful um, taking. Um, so you want somebody to be paying attention to that. You want a neurologist to give you an exam. I have a two-minute clip of a neurological exam. It sounds really scary. I think if if we have time and you watch it, you're going to uh, be able to maybe sort of better coax your loved one to go get one or feel more comfortable yourself about getting one. Um, but the neurologist is the brain specialist. Of course you want to see a neurologist and have them run you through some steps to um, figure out uh, what they think is going on with you. Uh, lab tests, blood tests uh, might involve imaging. Um, what are we looking for in blood? We're looking for infection. We're looking for um, uh, malnutrition. We're looking for dehydration. We're looking for uh, uh, oxygen levels. We're looking for vitamin B12. We're looking for the, um, the presence of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, those kind that just uh, like um, 
syphilis, right, is one that just doesn't show until it's like ravaged the brain. So we want to be looking for th signs and symptoms that are hiding, um, that are evident on blood tests. And imaging um, that show, there's lots of different kinds of imaging. We're going to talk a little bit about it. Do you want to know about a comprehensive exam? Let me see. I already told you those things. It's about like what we did at the beginning of the exercise. It involves paper and pencil, question and answer kinds of activities, and it looks at multiple areas of brain functioning. So here's a brain. This is a side view of the brain. So here's the front of my brain here. Um, that's our behavior control, um, emotional control. That's our judgment. That's our reasoning. Um, um, planning and problem solving and word production that's all um, part of frontal lobe activity back here is our parietal lobe that's where we have interpretation of um, touch and our sensory functions are and uh, sensitivity to pain back in the very back where my bun is here that's the uh, occipital lobe that controls vision visual perception our temporal lobe here let me get the right button here. This is our temporal lobe. It's sort of right um, inside our brain in this region. Um, it's, it's key for memory. Uh, it also contains um, some of our uh, language um, and emotion regulation. Neuropsych tests, that's that cognitive component, um, evaluates through those exercises all of those different components. I, I call it MAL. That's my way to try and remember it. It's memory, attention and concentration, language function, visual spatial function, and executive function, higher order levels of thinking. Um, what, you, what you will get, um, so if you look at this chart, at our clinic, when you leave, you get a chart that looks like this. So here's above average functioning, normal functioning is the white column here, mild, moderate, and severe functioning. If you're functioning in the severe range, you're functioning below 99% of your same age peers. Um, moderate, you're um, functioning below 95% of your same age peers. Um, you're at about the 85th percentile if you're in the mild, um, below. So 85% of your peers are functioning better than you are. And over on the left side here, there's that mouth. There's the um, domains of brain function that we talked about. So you, you complete our evaluation, we plug in all of your scores, right? And not just us, you can, you can contact the Alzheimer's Association Caregiver Resource Center. We have information um, for those uh, resources in your packet. Um, we're gonna put, uh, enter that data into our computer and it's gonna plot out on our chart like this. So this person right here is doing pretty well. So they're above average on their visual and long-term memory. They're pretty above average. This is strictly average here, this 50% line. Um, so they're above average in attention. They're still in the normal range on language, but they're a little bit low, uh, low average. And visual, uh, spatial, and executive function and, uh, are fine, and then they're a little bit low here on motor speed. Okay, so what does this tell you? It requires a neuropsychologist to really take a look at this and figure out, um, along with, because you can't diagnose just on neuropsych tests. Remember, we said you want to have a neurological exam, you want to have an informant interview, you want to have blood work, you want to have uh, maybe some scans, you want to look at what medications you're on. But this is going to tell us cognitively how you're functioning. And combined with all of those other pieces of information, um, you're going to get a pretty good, uh, reliable diagnosis. Well, so look what happens. Anything can affect how you do on a test on any given day, right? Maybe you didn't sleep well the night before. I was a little bit nervous last night. Didn't have my presentations quite wrapped up the way I wanted it. I didn't sleep well last night. So I could come in today and do very poorly on one of these tests. I might be really anxious. We have folks who come in and they're very anxious about what they might find out. Um, because they've maybe been experiencing problems and they don't know what, what the test <coughs> is going to show. It could depend on what medications you took. Did you have a surgical procedure recently? So anything can impact what these look like. But 
when you come back and you test again, we are starting to see here what this red line indicates is every single test score there is shifting to the right and moving toward these more impaired areas. So this is what neuropsychological testing can tell you about your functioning and where you fall compared to your normal age or your same age peers. Any questions about that one? All right. We talked a little bit about this. Um, you mentioned, sorry, earlier the bit about the strokes and uh, symptoms coming on rather abruptly. And that's one of those things that, we're, that uh, the diagnosticians are looking at. How do the symptoms come on? What has been their course over time? Um, do they fluctuate and get better? Um, do they get better for a while and then they get worse? Um, I, we talked about how most dementias, these things are going to be a, a progressive continual decline. There are some cases where, and nobody, nobody's, nobody's going to go down this path um, with the same identical set of symptoms. Right? So um, some, part, some people might fluctuate. They might do better on a given day and then not so good on another day. Um, so fluctuation doesn't mean that it's not a dementia. Um, it, it depends on a lot of different factors. But as a general rule, that slide is showing you if it came on very gradually, that's going to um, give the doctors a different um, signal than something that came on very suddenly. Um, and then we want to know what is their basic level of functioning. We talked about these. We're looking at lab tests. Um, we're looking at imaging. Um, we're looking at the structure of the brain. Some image, there's lots of different types of imaging. I'm not going to go into them, but um, one, you want to look at the structure. You want to look at metabolism for um, glucose. Uh, certain uh, dementias metabolize glucose differently in different uh, areas of the brain or, or under, um, what's the word, under activity level. And so you, different images are going to show you different things. You cannot diagnose dementia on an image alone. Um, so if, if you've seen a doctor and they took a brain image and they say, oh, you have Lewy body dementia or you have Alzheimer's disease, you want to make sure that some of these other tests have been done. Okay, neurological exam. Here's our two minute. You want to see a neurological exam? <laughs> Um, I pulled this off of the internet and I just thought that um, for as quick as it is, it, it's good and it's, it tells you that it's really not scary. First of all, stand with your feet together. And close your eyes. Eyes closed for a moment. Open your eyes. Can you walk heel to toe like this? Good. Walk on tip toes. Walk on your heels. That's lovely. Pull your arms out like this with Sorry, your palms flat. Much. And close your eyes. Keep your hands where they are. Keep those fingers straight if you can. Lovely. Keep still like that for a moment. And now with your eyes still closed, touch your nose with this fingertip. And with this fingertip. Good. Open your eyes. Play the piano. Good. And tap your hand. Other hand. That's good. Now turn and face me. And screw your eyes up tight. Lovely, relax. Silly blend. Stick your tongue out. Good, yeah. Good. That's lovely. Is it working? Right face. I can do point it for you. Right. <laughs> face. Just point the finger down that way. And my face can bear it. And the fingers can move. And stare at my finger. Now keep your head still and just follow the finger. Thank Painless. 
pretty painless. You're not going to get a three minute neurological exam. Okay? Um, it's going to take uh, anywhere from, should take anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes depending on the level of function. Um, and there's more that, that is done than just those few things. But I just thought that that was a good introduction so that you can see that some of this really is not so scary as it might seem. And essentially all of this stuff that we have been talking about, we are going through a process of elimination because we want to rule out absolutely everything else that it could possibly be before we give a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. There are reversible causes of uh, cognitive deficits and non-reversible causes. Reversible causes account for 5 to 15 percent of all cases. Non-reversible, 85 to 95 percent. These things are what we're looking for. This is why you need a comprehensive exam because all of these different kinds of uh, conditions can impair cognition. And nobody wants to leave an office with a diagnosis of dementia when um, if they went and got B12 shots or they put a CPAP mask on, that could remedy what's going on. Okay? This is what we're doing um, and what you want to seek out when you are um, going for a diagnosis to rule out absolutely everything else that it might be that could be reversible. Then uh, there's also conditions that are non-reversible, but they're non-progressive. So that's not a dementia either, because what did we say? Dementia is a progressive disease, that chart that shows how cognitively they're moving to the right, getting worse and worse. It's progressing. So there are conditions that are non-progressive. That's not dementia. Traumatic brain injury, a stroke, okay, causes symptoms that look like dementia, as do these things over here. That's not dementia, and you want to know exactly what it is that's going on. And then we have our dementias, and I didn't list all of them. There are many, many types. Any questions about that? I know some of you have to leave. Um, but we'll keep going. Please stop me if you have questions. So we talked a little bit about um, problems diagnosing uh, dementia. And these are some of the reasons why that happens. We talked about the importance of having a caregiver go into the room with you um, because uh, patient factors in not coming out with an appropriate diagnosis is because um, they think it's normal aging. Uh, they might be fearful and not reveal everything that's going on. They might be in denial. There might be shame. There's some cultural uh, conditions that might bring shame with something like a diagnosis like that. Uh, similarly, people just might think that it's fate. Folks go into the doctor and they might expect the doctor to be looking for those things and to um, find out without you communicating anything. But we talked about the insidious nature of the disease and how it doesn't um, it's not something that happens all of a sudden and you go, whoa, what's going on? It's very slow and it's very um, subtle, some of these changes that happen. And they increase in frequency over time. You might forget, your loved one might forget to ask or to tell the kinds of symptoms. How many times I go in and I've got a list when I go to the doctor, right? We get off topic on one discussion and I forget and I leave that office and I have to make another appointment because I've forgotten to ask about, oh, that, I, that problem that I'm having with attention or that, I get that forgetting problem. I forget to ask. And then there's physicians. There's, uh, physicians can misdiagnose. Um, I forget what the percentage is, but it, it's not a nice percentage. The um, general care practitioners and even specialty diagnoses when it's alternative types of dementia outside of Alzheimer's um, have difficulty. And you've seen some of those slides. Um, and now you can understand a little bit behind why that happens. Um, they think it's normal aging. Or patients might have multiple conditions. Maybe somebody had a stroke or had a cardiovascular incident and then they started having problems. And so we're just not paying attention to those and um, uh, putting all of the dots together to link up that it could be one of those conditions, it could be multiple conditions going on. And then there's these institutional factors. 
how much time does insurance let you spend with your doctor? I think it was like 15 minutes, now it's like down to, you said 10 minutes, I've heard you get 7.2 minutes, right? So, um, no time. Not enough dementia care specialists, we're trying to remedy that. Um, and then limits on diagnostic tests um, in managed care. All right, so you want to have treatment recommendations. Treatment recommendations should focus on all of these things, not just the person with the diagnosis, right? So you want to know what medications are out there that can help um, with memory and cognitive impairment. We have four federally, uh, federally approved medications um, at the moment. They're not a cure. Um, they um, help with some of the symptomology. They might provide for a higher quality of life for a little bit longer period of time. They don't work for everybody. Um, and some people cannot tolerate the side effects that come with them. Um, you want uh, recommendations that um, work on the individual's strengths and weaknesses. If somebody's having visual spatial difficulties, you want to be talking about should you be driving, you want to be talking about should you pull up the area runs. Um, you want to be talking about all kinds of issues. If they have strengths in their visual, spatial, uh, maybe they should take an art class. Maybe they should do um, some sort of activity that involves that creative part of their brain that is uh, working for them and give them some sense of success and uh, self-respect and enjoyment in life where these other things are happening um, that are falling down for them. So you want treatment recommendations that focus on the person and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, treatments to restore, prolong, or improve cognitive function. You have some brain games there. Um, just an example, you, there's free websites, you can go explore them. We did that exercise at the beginning. Um, stimulate yourself, keep engaged. Same thing for your loved one. And these two down here are primarily um, uh, helpful for caregivers. This is a, this is a life uh, long progressive degenerative disease. Thank you. And um, who's responsible? Life long for the rest of this person's life when this person is slowly declining to the point where they, um, you know, every body function essentially is going to shut down. It's the caregiver. And we have statistics that show that somewhere um, if they change, um, it's 60 to 66 percent. Um, it, the people are looking at those numbers a little bit more closely now, but uh, for a long time that the percentage rate was 66% of caregivers die before the person that they're caring for, especially um, in Alzheimer's and related dementias. And that's because this is a 24 hour, seven day a week, um, progressive uh, condition um, that requires all kinds of uh, attention and fixes um, and hands-on detective work um, and the like. So you want to be linking this caregiver to all kinds of information, education, support, therapy. Um, uh, you want them to know every resource in the community. Is there transportation available? Are there folks that can come into my home and let me get out of my home and take a break, uh, respite care? You want to, uh, that person to know what long-term um, care facilities are available, daycare where a person can go, assisted living facilities where couples can go together that maybe has a memory wing, and so as time goes on, they can still be in the same location, but one goes into a memory wing. You want to get all of your legal affairs in order. Um, it, it's endless, right? <laughs> all right, so for those of you who are here, um, uh, treatment recommendations that are made for the, the person with dementia are also meant for caregivers because you too have a life to live. You too are in that baby boomer generation where those numbers don't look good. And these are things that you can do that research shows right now that may be preventive for you. So you want to maintain a blood pressure that's within the normal range, below 140. Cholesterol. cholesterol, cholesterol just links to so many different um, illnesses. Uh, so you want that in check. Diabetes also can be linked to cholesterol. I mean, I just want to keep going back to cholesterol. 
Um, depression, it's going to be a, a long, hard road. You want to be able to manage that. Um, watch what medications you take. Be very careful. Um, and do a three minute, do more than a three minute, okay? Do 15 minutes of exercise a day, physical exercise, cognitive stimulation, get up and move, move your body, get your um, blood flow. These are the other things you can do. So essentially, watch your weight, be active, watch what you eat. Um, some recent studies show that a um, Mediterranean diet can reduce the risk up to like 38% something like that in our, in a recent study. So um, watching what you eat, very important, limit caffeine, okay, okay. These, smoking, caffeine, cholesterol, stress, all of these things reduce blood flow and are going to impact your brain eventually. Okay, so you have materials. Um, here and out on the table. On either side of the bin on the table are the same materials, so if you are interested in which one you don't have to just stick to one side. Unfortunately, what's in the bin is just in the bin. But please fill out your, rec your evaluations for the program. Um, it's helpful to Jerry, it's gonna be very helpful to me. Um, you can look us up online at UCI Mind. Um, but here's some more statistics for you, for caregivers. 30% of Alzheimer's disease caregivers have children under 18. So we have a sandwich generation of caring for uh, young ones as well as their elderly um, adults in the family. It constitutes over $15 million of unpaid, uh, or $15 million of unpaid care by family caregivers. 17 billion hours, billion with a B. How many times is that gonna wrap around the planet? Um, and it involves much higher, much more intensive um, care um, on the part of the caregiver than caregivers of other uh, diseases. Depression um, is twice as high in caregivers of loved ones with Alzheimer's or dementias. If any of you um, have experienced it in here, you know. There's financial, there's family relationships, there's decreases in your own personal health, um, changes in your work schedule. And the gamut runs from, runs from day to day kinds of activities to uh, very complex legal, financial, medical care. Um, in addition to the caregiver's own issues that they're dealing with. Emotions uh, are exploding from guilt to fear to panic uh, to confusion. Um, and then you still have to have conversations with the person who's losing their mind, um, literally, and their ability to read uh, about changes that have to take place. And you might have other family members who don't agree with you, who are not on the same page with you, who emotionally, as they go through their journey, are in a very different place than you are. And that's a very trying thing for caregivers as well. And then the role changes to all of a sudden, instead of being a lover, partner, companion, to being um, nursemaid and changing diapers or um, feeding someone or bathing someone that you have um, spent your entire life with. So it's immense, immense changes and um, strain for caregivers. So just an example of resources that are out there for you. I have two pages of these. Mm -hmm. um, what I've given you looks more like, oops, looks more like this. Um, and I've just highlighted it for you by the type of service that you might be interested in and where you can go to find them. So here we go again. Do, your, do yourself uh, kind and uh, do a little 15 minute, eight minute, four minute energizer every day. I will entertain any questions if we have time.